So the first chapter was about science in general, and now the second chapter, we're going to get an introduction to atoms, ions, and molecules. So we start with a little bit of history. We go back to 1896, Henri Becquerel. He was the one who first noticed that some materials produced what we commonly consider radiation at this point. He was looking at the charged particles that came off of them. He wasn't aware of the gamma rays. This radioactivity happens spontaneously, and the emission is a high energy radiation. We don't normally think of just light, but something more powerful than what we consider to be light in the normal sense of what we as humans can naturally see, and particles. So we had a few that he had looked at. There were beta particles, which turned out to be electrons moving rapidly, high energy, in other words, because of their kinetic energy. And alpha particles, which turn out to be uh, a helium nucleus. They're a lot heavier, and they have a plus two charge instead of a negative one charge like the electrons, the beta particles. A very interesting thing about him is that Marie Curie was his graduate student, and she ended up getting a Nobel Prize for her work on radiation. That's interesting. Now, what is another interesting side note is that uh, James Clerk Maxwell had already, more than 20 years earlier, published equations governing electromagnetics. So the idea of charges moving and creating a magnetic field and that sort of thing was already known, and yet it hadn't been figured out that things could also move through the air instead of just through wires. Now, why should we believe that these things are particles, and why should we believe that they have a charge? Here is a very simple cathode ray tube. All they were doing was producing the particles at the cathode. Since the cathode and the anode have different charges, the particles would accelerate to get to the anode. They were trying to complete the circuit. But the anode itself, if you look very closely here, you'll see there's an opening in it. So the ones that don't actually hit the anode end up flying right through the center, and that makes a thin beam. Now this thin beam can be affected by either a magnetic field or an electric field. And so what they're showing here is that depending on the charge, it will veer right or left under the magnetic field. It will veer up or down depending on the charge and the electric field. How do you know it actually was something happening? Well, there's a phosphorescent coating here on the front, and when a particle hits it, it will transfer its energy, the energy will then be reappear as a phosphorescent spot that you can actually see the light. So J.J. Thompson was responsible for doing this sort of experiment before 1900 still. And what he could observe then when he was doing this work is that the beam from the cathode ray tube was deflected toward the positively charged plate. Well, if it's attracted to a positively charged plate, it's just going too fast to actually land there. It keeps going, but it ends up getting curved. And if it's being attracted to a positive, it must have a negative charge. So he said atoms must have negatively charged particles in them, and that there is some sort of constant mass to charge ratio, because this curve is always the same. It's not like there's three different ones that would indicate that something was heavier and didn't get deflected as much, or lighter and got deflected more. No, it was always a very consistent curve. So it's one single ratio. There's a mass to charge ratio. Robert Millikan, now you can see this is more than 10 years later, because at that point they've got the ratio of the mass to the charge, but they really like to know the mass and the charge separately instead of as a ratio. He came up with this oil droplet experiment. And what it consisted of, here's an atomizer. You can think of this as like a perfume bottle. It'll emit a very fine spray. In this case, it's oil drops. And they're very consistently sized because they tend to fall into a 
particular range of droplet size that is stable. So all these droplets exist. They're heavier than air. They're going to start falling. We're talking about these plates. Here's a positively charged plate. Well, most of the oil is just going to end up falling on the plate. But again, tiny little hole in the center where the ones that happen to be exactly in that area will fall straight through and fall down. Meanwhile, if it does go down this route, it is going to intersect with this X-ray beam. So the X-ray beam is going to result in charges being uh, created on the droplet, okay? And then you can examine how long it took them to fall by actually physically watching it and timing it. This is so far back there that all the work had to be done by direct observation. You couldn't automate any of it. I mean, you'd be squeezing the atomizer and then you would watch. <laughs> when he got done, we ended up with the actual charge on an electron, which as you can see is a very tiny number. It is negative. It's 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why the heck was that so small? Well, because remember, we said that James Clerk Maxwell came up with all of his equations well before this. It's like 35 years earlier than this that he came up with those and they had set coulomb as an amount, it seemed like a reasonable amount at the time. They didn't realize how small the individual electron charge were going to be. So it turns out to be 10 to the minus 19. And the mass of an electron, oh my gosh, that's really, really small too. 10 to the negative 28. Oh my gosh. And one of the other interesting things about this experiment is when he first did it, these numbers weren't right. They were in the neighborhood, but they were not right. And it took many years for the science to catch up, to make this accurate enough experiment to get the numbers to be this accurate. Needless to say, then people had to start talking about, well, here's an atom we know that has negative parts of it that can get loose. What is a good model for the atom? Now, this is the model that failed. They came up with the idea that the positive charge was somehow just completely distributed throughout the atom and that the electrons were individual particles within it. They came up with this idea because essentially it seems like the electrons were easy to get loose and the positive things weren't. So they were just thinking, okay, so these are like discrete things and these others are like a spongy sort of thing. I don't know. This is what they were thinking. Now, because it was an English theory, it got named the plum pudding model. Now, this is a terrible name for any of us who are American because we absolutely do not understand any reference to a so-called plum pudding. To us, pudding is jello pudding. I mean, it, that's the only thing. A pudding to English people is more or less almost any dessert. If you think of it as more like the blueberry muffin model, I think you would understand their name more. You know, the electrons are like the blueberries distributed in the whole muffin. 